first, before I start digging into the problem statement, I should maybe uh, uh, preface that by explaining my, the motivation of what I've done and, and why I've done it. First one is why do I focus in on GDP? There aren't there other ways of measuring economic development? Uh, yes, certainly. I don't take as a, as, a, as a given that GDP is better than to think about freedoms and unfreedoms as suggested by Amartya Sen or Human Development Index and so forth and so forth. I don't have a stake in which is the most appropriate measure of development. I'm just saying the most important one as in terms of most commonly used and most influential is certainly GDP. The front page of uh, The Economist 10 years ago, the hopeless continent, Africa is the hopeless continent, was informed by one piece of evidence dominantly. It was the GDP and the, the lack of, of growth in GDP. Uh, once again, this year, it is, you know, we have changed our mind completely. Now it is the, the hopeful continent, the emerging Africa, Africa rising. Again, it is the GDP that drives this debate. So I think I focused in on the most important piece of, of, of uh, in terms of this is agenda driving uh, type of evidence. And also it is of course, because it's a history of the statistical offices, it's the right indicator to focus on. A statistical office is, you know, from the Keynesian tradition, they collect, you know, data on government expenditure, imports and exports, balance of payments, uh, how government money is spent and, and, and collected, health statistics, educational statistics, agricultural statistics, they do a population census, you do a transport survey and all that stuff, and the whole exercise is all to give this one number at the end, it's the GDP. So if you focus in on the GDP, it's the symptom of the whole statistical system in a sense. So it's a, the summary statistic that tells you something about the statistical capacity and also the extent to which the state knows things about itself. So that's why it's analytically important to look at it. And I think also it has been a, a my book hopes to, to strive that, uh, to, to uh, uh, reconnect what I have thought has been an unhealthy academic divide for quite a while is that there is two types of scholars. You know, no, there are more. There are more than two types of scholars. But let's say for the sake of argument, there is two types of scholars. There is those who would never ever be purely and solely informed by GDP and is, you know, would dismiss it as meaningless. And there are those who would never ever think about questioning it. That would be you know, the kind of divide. I hope that to show that in order to use these statistics, we need to know the, the politics of producing them, the history of producing them, the anthropology of using them and so forth. So there is a call for interdisciplinary approaches to interpret uh, essentially economic statistics. Uh, why do I focus on in on Africa? Sometimes I get very uh, angry uh, responses that this is just another kind of African bashing type of, of exercise. I assure you that there are, it is not meant that way. And I would argue that, so I would like to point out that measurement problems are indeed universal. Yeah? So all GDP numbers are wrong. Every single one of them. So that should not be you. There is you know, black economy, illegal economy, informal economy to a different extent, tax exemptions, cheating and so forth goes on to some extent all, all across. But we know there are particular problems of measuring GDP in poorer countries. So all the other things being equal, you're less likely to keep accurate records. There is less uh, likely that the state collects taxation information on you below a certain poverty level and so forth and so forth. So therefore, it is a particular uh, problem in, in in poorer countries, the problem is even stronger in Sub-Saharan Africa because of, for instance, the state's uh, tendency uh, of not correcting, collecting direct taxes, taxes, which means there is less information. States don't collect information because they're so curious. They, want, uh, they collect information in order to collect uh, uh, money, taxes, and therefore the taxation system has a particular characteristic in Sub-Saharan Africa, which we could talk about, which then justifies the African focus. And those are the structural problems, the conjectural ones are also weighing very heavily. We all know, sitting in this room, that Sub-Saharan Africa was harder hit by the economic crisis in the 1980s and 1990s. Well, we thought we knew, based on GDP statistics. Uh, so therefore, there are, uh, but we know that there was uh, structural adjustment had fundamental consequences about how states were organized, and therefore 
uh, conjecture as well, this focus is justified. Uh, so, I've been helped a little bit in promoting my book by uh, Ghana Statistical Services. Because just as I, you know, on the 5th of November 2010, that was six months after I'd been at, at the Ghana Statistical Services, and I knew this news was pending, of course, because I had consulted with the head of macroeconomic statistics there. On the 5th of November 2010, Ghana Statistical Services announced that its GDP for the year 2010 was revised to almost 45 billion ZD. And this compared to the GDP number was which the official number the day before of 26 billion ZD. Of course, uh, this meant that you know if you do the kind, you could say this is almost a doubling in GDP. If you do the increase as a percentage of the new level, you that which is what we prefer to the preferred conservative spin on this story, is then that there's an income level increase of 60%. Moreover, it also meant that suddenly the Ghanaian GDP per capita used to be between $500 and $600, was now suddenly $1,100. Ghana used to be a poor country, it is now a middle-income poor country. And this income classification was agreed upon with the World Bank uh, uh, a year later, so that meant that on the 5th of November, on the 4th of November, uh, Ghana was eligible for concessional lending. On the 6th of November, it was not longer anymore. Um, so, undoubtedly, this is good news. Ghana is richer than we thought they were. So that's, you know, one thing that you should not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that's the bad news in any sense. Uh, the bad thing is that there is a knowledge problem that does emerge. <laughs> because um, where did this income come from? How do we now compare this new number in Ghana with the other numbers in Nigeria and so forth. Uh, so there is some, some, and there is, that's why there is a need for, for this book, because uh, clearly at either at, at development experts as well, this was quite surprised by this news. Uh, Todd Moss at the Center of Global Development in Washington DC, you know, very honestly, this is the nice thing about academics blogging nowadays, he <laughs> wrote out, boy, we really don't know anything, and he correctly observed that Ghana is the most closely watched uh, economy in Sub-Saharan Africa. How could we have missed this? And if you dig into that, there are many people who are, are red-faced about the reports they've written the day before about what is required to take Ghana into middle-income status, what kind of investments and so forth. Uh, Andy Sumner, uh, in London, and Charles Kenny, previously World Bank, took a completely different spin. They wrote an op-ed in, in The Guardian and saying, haha, now it turns out uh, Paul Collier and Dan Bisamoyo, they are now wrong. Ghana shown that they just moved out of the poverty trap. So taking it undoubtedly as good news, UN, uh, UN Development uh, Program in Ghana maintained this is a statistical illusion pointing to the fact that there has been no similar changes in other indicators such as health and social development and so forth. So they, of course, justifying their own existence in Ghana as well, has to, of course, maintain that this number is, is not uh, what it should be. Shanta Dravajan, in a desperate attempt of damage control, uh, in the chief, in the chief economist of, of, for Africa, went out and declared Africa's statistical tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because of the extent of the knowledge problem. And so there, there is clearly a little bit of confusion and so forth. I'll try to walk you through a little bit how we came to this. But just to know, uh, there might be some evidence that, you know, non watch this space, because this Ghana is, was the most, the Ghana is not new in revising their GDP statistics. This happens from time to time. It was a bit bigger than normal, but it, one of the most things that was actually was remarkable about it is how open, transparent, and, 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 and uh, well-publicized it has been. So that's the, that's the good news, really, as well, that this is going on in, in the eye of the public. What's going on in, and I spoke with uh, the directors of statistics of Nigeria last week, he was visiting me in Vancouver. They are working on their own GDP revision in Nigeria. Uh, and then the, the back of the envelope kind of uh, estimates, of course, it's a bit early to announce what the size of the new GDP will be before the numbers are actually ready. But people are talking about a doubling of GDP in Nigeria as well, on the same extent which just happened in Ghana. 
This alone, because Nigeria is so big, having a population of anywhere between 145 to 165 million at the moment, uh, this means a addition to total sub-Saharan African GDP of 15%. Yeah, only the revision. It means that Nigeria would move up on top of South Africa in terms of total economic size and so forth they get their base there. And if you take it seriously, there is currently 40 Malawis currently unaccounted for inside Nigeria, which is kind of daunting um, when you start thinking about the size of the knowledge problem. So I think I, I put forward that there is a knowledge problem and we are all a bit confused about it. I suggest that there are some ways about getting around this uh, in a systematic way, which is the, the kind of questions that have been guiding me while writing this book. One is, as I talked about, is a question about validity. As I point out in, in, in the book, validity, we often think about that whether that means that the number is correct. Some, the, the root of the word validity comes from the same as power, so sometimes it is that the, the we trust in numbers not because of their correctness but rather by the authority that is behind them. But nevertheless, we know that the answer to this question is GDP correctly measured is always no, it isn't, right? But so the validity problem is there with varying at intensity. In Germany, it might be three or four percent. In Greece, it might be 50 to 20 to 30 percent. In Ghana, as we just show, it has at least 60 percent or give or take half of an economy on each side. And Nigeria might be double. So that is the validity question. What is really matters is reliability. Because reliability is the, the question to, is two types of question. One is, is the mismeasurement consistent across time and across space? And this is important if you think about GDP as a scale where you are interested in measuring your own weight. Now, if you are on a particular diet and so forth, you might have one of those bathroom scales at home, and we all know those scales are wrong. They are wrong with a little, well, at least it was before these fantastic new digital ones, but back in the days you had this, this, uh, and then, you know, and you, this would always be off with the three or four pounds. But that's not a problem because it would be off by exactly the same amount each day. So you will be knowing whether you're losing weight or gaining weight, which is essentially the number, the, the trend you're interested in. This is not a problem as long as you are comparing yourself and you're using the same weight when you are comparing yourself. The problem appears if, as if now, that you start you know, talking about your weight, which you shouldn't do, of course, talk to your uh, weight with your neighbor across the fence saying how much do you weigh and so forth like that. And then if the scales are off and off by a lot, you might be misinformed. Even worse is, is if you change your own scale. Or, as is the case, it turns out, if someone in the middle of the night comes into the room and, 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 uh, and, and switches up the scales. So this is, the problem here is that there is a mismeasurement that is not consistent across space and is not con consistent across time. We suddenly lost track of a big, big chunk of GDP in, in Ghana and now we don't know where it came from. We don't know when, when, it, uh, when Ghana gained this economic activity and we don't know how to compare it with, with uh, economic activity in, in uh, Nigeria. Um, so one validity test I did some years ago, inspired by having read uh, the work that underlies the book Why Nations Fail by Archimoglu and, and, and Robinson. Some of you might have read Nathan Nunn's work on the economic effects of slavery and so forth. They all have like some kind of history event X in the past, causes, uh, income divergence as measured by GDP per capita today. So then you have this ranking of countries and they say the, the countries that had a bad experience and so forth, looking at correlations between, between these phenomena. And I wanted to just to check whether if you do the same, if you take the same measure, that is GDP per capita, for the same year, for the same set of countries, using the most commonly used databases, what are the results you get? Uh, and so here's what the, the table I got. Angus Madison, those of you who have done some economic history might be using Angus Mad Madison's work. Some of you heard uh, the crisis list recently with the economic historians Reinhardt and Rogoff. That was based on a miscalculation in New Zealand, I think. Uh, and here, this is GDP per capita in international US dollars 
according to Angus Madison for the year 2000. World development indicators, that's the data, World Bank data, same thing, GDP in international dollars for the year 2000. And from Pendle tables, which is the database all econometricians use, if you're reading any growth paper by Collier or Easterly or so forth, they were using the Pendle tables. Now, the dollar values are different because they are harmonized using different formulas. But in theory, this should be uh, the same underlying evidence expressed at different values. So we wouldn't expect them to be, so don't pay attention to the cash values. What I was interested in, do they at least agree upon which countries are rich and which countries are poor? Because they should, if there is an error, it should be systematic. It should not be uh, random. It turns out they agree upon one thing and one thing only, and that is that Congo, Democratic Republic, is the poorest country in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I, I've done something new here, put the poorest on top and the richest at the bottom, just to, to switch it up a little bit. And beyond that, there is the disagreement is quite large, and I'll highlight some of them, uh, such as, for instance, that according to Madison, Guinea is the seventh poorest uh, economy in Sub-Saharan Africa, whereas the Penwell Tables think it's among the 15 richest. Uh, you'll see that, that uh, Liberia is considered in the middle, uh, in the middle half of, of uh, countries uh, by Angus Madison, whereas Penwell Tables would have it that Liberia is the second poorest country in Sub-Saharan Africa. What this is showing, telling me, is that these international databases cannot possibly be based on the same time series. So the, 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 basic, uh, uh, the basic message is that what the problem is, which we just saw in Ghana, right now the world development indicators have updated their estimates for, for Ghana, Angus Madison hasn't, and Pendle Tables hasn't uh, either. And when they are going to put this new GDP data together, then they based on different kind of, kind of evidence, different types, when these observations were made, and all the end result is a, a confusion about the relative ranking of, of, uh, of countries. Because one thing we tend to forget is that uh, where these data come from. I think if you read a book, uh, 1970s, 1980s, a country study written by an economist, he would invariably be using statistical abstracts from the country, etc., etc., different economic reports, economic survey, and so forth. Studies today tend to be using these international databases. And I think one of, the, one of the things that we have forgotten is that all these data do, of course, originate at the statistical office. So in order to use these data or accept them or not accept them, you have to know under which conditions they were produced. Uh, so they come from, uh, this is the statistical services uh, in Accra, in Ghana, where I conducted my research, was talking to uh, Magnus uh, Edward Duncan about the GDP revision here below. Here is actually the informal sector, just uh, in front. Uh, this is a peanut uh, saleswoman uh, where I used to get my lunch together with the, uh, at the time. I asked the director of macroeconomic statistics at the point, uh, is, is she counted in the recent GDP estimate? And they said, it's only peanuts. Uh, it turns out when you put the peanuts, stack them up high, they do, uh, do make a difference. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, so these data are, are collected. This is the Nigerian Living Standards Survey, uh, first collected. That's how it looks like before it <laughs> comes into a, an Excel sheet. Here is how it looks like when it's getting into the Excel sheet. And we still have not gotten that survey yet. That was in 2010. The data is still being processed, but very soon we'll have uh, new poverty data, new living household data for Nigeria and so forth. So it's important, and I hope that you at least take this one away today, that all GDP level estimates and growth series are based on data from the National Statistical Office. So that means that there's no, although we somehow fooled ourselves into this kind of thing, oh, my, I am using World Bank data, in theory they don't know and they don't have independent data collection capacity, they don't know anything more than anyone else. If the data are missing, they are guessing. And that's one of the things we will come to very soon. And this is true for poverty data, population data, agricultural data, and so forth. The difference is this raw data is collected by these international databases, sometimes by law, through the United Nations Statistical Office. You have to, by law, submit this data on an annual basis. Um, 
but the way in which they put the series together is the way they communicate them, harmonize them, index them, and so forth. That's where the, all the variation starts happening. So, but in order to understand how much knowledge there is in the basic stuff, we need to go to the statistical offices. So one of the things I want to do with this book is to reconnect data users and data producers and not do this rely on data retailing to the extent we do. Um, which is a message which is quite clear, I think, to historians and anthropologists, but is um, unfamiliar uh, for, for many economists. Uh, so let's, knowing that, we need to just try to figure out uh, what happened in Ghana. And in order to understand what happened in Ghana, we need to do, unfortunately, a little bit of national accounting. We need to figure out how we do GDP. This used to be basics of an economics training and degree. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Keynesian identities and so forth, but I'll give you a very, very quick run through about how to, we are collecting GDP. GDP is, of course, the sum of all goods and services pro produced, consumed, or, or earned in a particular, uh, at a particular place in a given year. Uh, and there's three ways of coming through this. Theoretically, all GDP, here represented by Y, uh, is, has to be equal to all expenditure, or it has to be all, uh, equal to all income, so that all GDP is, of course, earned either through wages, rents, and profits. On the expenditure side, that looks like consumption, investment, government, plus minus exports and imports. Uh, and finally, all goods and services are produced, so another way we could do it is to add up all value added, the production in all sectors, in agriculture, in mining, manufacturing, construction, trade, etc., services and government. So you can just put the industrial tables together. So that's how we do it. Theoretically, you should do these three independent calculations, and then you can, you know, as they do in the beauty of double bookkeeping and so forth, all numbers ma uh, matches up and so forth, and you have a check of this. In, in practice, uh, you will already see that there are some problems about informational gaps in getting accurate information on this. Uh, one problem is if you want to do the expenditure, the, there is a problem, of course, that investment, rural road building, and, and land clearing, all that stuff will usually be missing. But the big missing is the consumption bit. We do not, we simply don't have an annual household budget survey. So we, we don't have tax incomes on persons, so we don't get that data on an annual basis. This is a hopeless starter because you don't know have information on the big smallholder sector or the urban sector when it comes to their wages. Uh, we still not agreed upon how to account for unemployment in sub-Saharan Africa, much less how to, to, to account, uh, account wages. Uh, so this, uh, this is a non-starter. The way the workhorse of how GDP is estimated is that you go through the industrial tables and you try to add up as much information you have for agriculture and you try to figure out what you have for mining. So here you might get good information on export crops, less on food. Mining, you'll know what the big mines do, but you don't know anything about the quarries. In manufacturing, again, operators, you would know the big international companies, but all the small stuff, not at all, not the repairs. Construction, usually a big missing thing. We don't know how many houses are built and so forth and how much it costed to do so. Usually we use a proxy of number of population, and multiply by a certain amount, and then you say it grows with cement production in the country or something like that. Trade usually derived as a residual of agriculture manufacturing. We know that growth here should be roughly on the side of that. The same with services is all considered as, as residual activity. So you, you add up in one given year, which is what Ghana did. In 1993, they added up all the value, the best possible guess they have for each of these sectors in 1993. In UK, in Germany, in US, you would then next year do the same thing, add up all the information you got, and then compare it with last year's. You don't have time to do that in Ghana or elsewhere. You cannot make a new sum because you, you simply don't have the time to, to collect the data. So once you have the base year, which is 1993, the old base year in Ghana, you use a proxy, a kind of an indicator that captures movement in each of these sectors. And that is probably okay of a guess in 1994. It might even be fine in 1998. That's what IMF says. That's the cutoff for a year. Then you, after five years, you might be getting into unknown terrain. What happened in Ghana was that they kept the base year in 1993 all the way until 2010. And now they rebased to 2006. So they made a new sum for 2006. In the meantime, 
their proxies had lost a lot of economic activity. They haven't captured through the value added taxes what were going on in the service sectors. They haven't cap they did collect data on line phones, not cell phones, and so forth and so forth. A lot of things happens over two decades, right? The reason why we think that Nigeria is going to be such a big jump in GDP is that they haven't changed their base here since 1990. So we have 23 years of guessing that what we, the guess we made in 1990 was more or less accurate. And so that's why you've got the function. So this is the, the importance of the base here. And that's uh, also, if you do not change the base here, then you cannot put in new economic growth because you will have then an unnatural statistical growth and so forth. So these, there are then breaks in the statistical series that you need to pay attention to and which also would determine how rich they come to. So. so Ghana is an exceptional case in that we know how this went on and that they have now also an updated base here. They have data for 2010. Many other countries don't. Uh, if you start looking at the statistical office's websites so ask, you know, when did you last estimate GDP, you'll find there's big gaps in the data. Yet, if you go to the World Bank, you can download full, consistent, harmonized GDP uh, series from 1960 until to, to this very day. So even countries that have not produced their own statistics, the World Bank knows uh, how they're being grown. Uh, so some of these countries have not published their own numbers, yet they are available in the databases. Uh, there are breaks in this series. I would like to know what did you do with the extra half of gamma now when did you add it? Did you add it to 1994? Where, where, where did you put it? And, and so forth. Um, and so I wanted to know basically how do they come up with these numbers? And this is what I started at because I went to the World Bank data manual, which I, I emailed the World Bank in 2007, asked how do you come up with these numbers? How do you make harmonize this series? Then they said, oh, it's all written down in the data manual, which I then is a very interesting document, but uh, I nevertheless went through it and they said, you know, what, when they have gaps in the series, you know what they do? They have a method which is called filling the gap method. Um, <laughs> so it's quite advanced. Uh, and this, this depends a little bit on discretion, whether you then, you know, you have missed data between years, so then you draw a line, a regression line between them. You miss data on Somalia, so you do the average of in Sudan and Kenya, and so forth, and different ways of doing. This is, you know, we do that sometimes, economic historians do this all the time. The Cypriotic GDP is the average of Sicily and, and, and Greece, of course. So, <laughs> so that's, that's how we do things. But so, so I wanted to, uh, to access the real data behind it, because I said, you know, I would just like to see how you actually did this, because I wanted to find out whether growth did improve in Tanzania after structure adjustment, or if it's just the fiction of the data. So I asked them, uh, could I get the, the real data, please? And they, they brought back, raw data provided by national statistical agencies are not available to, for external users, and only a handful of people at the World Bank have access to it. Um, the World Data Group denied that this is their policy until I showed them the email. Then they confirmed that indeed it is their policy. And they <laughs> do not share it. And they made the, 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 the suggestion, which is, you know, typically goes under the category of easier said than done, just ask me, you might want to visit the national statistical offices directly. Which is, you know, a big ask for one single young PhD student, but I, I did my, my best. So between 2007 and 2010, I did visit some statistical offices. I went to Ghana, I went to Nigeria, I went to Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, Botswana and Malawi where I did interviews and archival work, trying to write the history about how GDP has changed, what is the data sources, I asked them, how do you come to know, how much do you know, what are your resources, and so forth, how is national income measured, how does it affect prevailing judgment of African growth, was my analytical question, and then archival work, you know, different libraries, to, because sometimes these archives at the statistical offices are not well maintained, as you might guess, Sometimes you have to go to other sources to try to find those publications that are missing. In addition, I did an email survey of Burundi, Cameroon, Cap Verde, Guinea, Lesotho, Mali, Mauritania, Mauritius, Morocco, Namibia, Mozambique, Niger, Senegal, Seychelles, and South Africa in order to get as far as I could a continent-wide kind of picture of this story. Uh, one way of thinking it is the validity question of today. So how much do we know uh, when we download the data? One thing I found out, I did 
compare with you know the World Bank does publish 2010 estimate. I went to each of the statistical office and asked him, as, when did you last do an estimate? Because then at least we know the gap between the guessing and the making up and the filling the gap that is being used. And you see it varies quite a lot. Uh, some countries like Burundi and Ghana uh, are up to date. Others are a, a sometimes as much as a decade behind. Um, so here to 2000 and so forth, the gap. Um, so that's one of the things that matters. The other one is that we talked about is the base year. We talked about that Ghana used to have a 2006 base year. At 1993, now they have a 2006 base year. But you see here, they are not alone in having a 2006 base year. So does Burkina Faso. So does well, uh, Gambia is 2004. But then there are other countries, such as Guinea-Bissau in 1986 base year. Um, Cabo 1980, Central African Republic 1985, so we, we're talking about two to three decades of not updating the basic benchmark data. Some countries do not respond in any way. This non-response is what we call a biased non-response data. I think the lower the statistical capacity, the less likely that they want to talk to me. And for some reasons also because of, you know, uh, we wouldn't expect uh, uh, you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo to give me any information at that point, they were busy with other things. Um, so that uh, another way which I also looked at it was to compare uh, what is the information on, so the last time Burundi prepared an estimate was 2007. So then I went back and looked at the same numbers for 2007 for the same year. So how is, do they agree upon that year at least? At least for that year they should have the same data, shouldn't they? Uh, but they no, sometimes don't. Burundi thinks it's one third richer than what the World Bank thinks. Otherwise, it go, other times it goes other ways. The World Bank thinks that Guinea-Bissau is richer than they say, say they are, and so forth. So what I'm putting forward here is one uh, very clearly the map, economical map, to of the GDP measure is giving us a very uneven level uh, of of uh, comparisons. That means that the GDP levels are misleading. And this also tells us something about knowledge of other indicators uh, as well. Um, so that's uh, the basic um, summary story is uh, that 34 countries uh, uh, responded. IMF recommendation has uh, every five year. That is uh, only seven has following that recommendation. 21 countries has a base year that has been the last decade. So that's almost half being reasonably okay where they should be, but another 13 countries have very old base years. So when you compare uh, GDP statistics across there, you will get very, very biased information. The uh, other, that gives you uh, the, the basic, uh, basic current map, the other type uh, of document this well, of course, that this is just one snapshot of today. This beyond, beyond that lies a history of how these, the statistical capacity have been constrained at these offices. And I do, as I said, uh, give a short history of national accounting in Sub-Saharan Africa in the book. Uh, one of the interesting things is how important, uh, and you know, uh, the scholarly early debates and the colonial estimates, some, some places you get very unintended consequences, such as in Uganda, the trade statistics are, is until last year only collected in Mombasa because of the East African uh, 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 region. Um, it is quite a telling story to, if you uh, as well, if you look at the library shelves in your library as well and other libraries, you can just check the width of the publications coming out of your statistical office in any given decade and then any given indicator, in fact, and you'll find a lot about what is the capacity of the, the statistical office to collect, analyze and disseminate their own data, do they, what do they focus on. One interesting thing is that there is more industrial censuses, much richer administrative data in the 1960s and the 1970s. When you write this type of history, one of the key uh, distinctions you need to make is between administrative data and survey data. So the administrative data is the type of data that the government or a statistical office do collect based on its day-to-day -day operation, which is very different from a survey data, which is a very specific, where someone says, we want to find out about this problem, or we want to check if you have a certain problem. In the early days, 
because of the very active state, the statistical offices could rely much more on administrative data. The problem comes with the, the structure adjustment, where we have a, which is a double shock to the statistical system. A, government funds are cut back, so they stop reporting the stuff they should be. B, we know that the formal economy was in some sort of crisis. We know that governments used to buy and sell and transport agricultural goods on a large scale in the 60s and 70s, stopped doing so entirely in the 1980s. This has big implications for the informational flow. We don't know how much is being in the channels, how much is outside of the channels. Anyhow, you don't get the data on it. So you get the double shock as the informal economy is growing, but the type of growth is diffi more difficult to account for. It's more expensive to collect that information, as well as we know that many of the statistical officers were not collecting wages to the extent that they actually were inspired or incentivized to do their job in many places. This has changed quite a bit in the, the latter period with the focus towards poverty and measurement and the millennial development goals um, where we have more and more less administrative data and more and more reliance on survey data and very often donors say we have now invested in such and such a program now we want a report and uh, that gives us evidence this is all framed in the evidence-based policy the problem is that this is very hard to handle for one statistical office and uh, the Millennium Development Goals, may I remind you, is eight goals, 18 indicators, and 48 targets. Yeah? They, we were talking about a massive Excel sheet that needs filling. Lots of gaps that needs to be filled on poverty, on education, on, on life expectancy, water supply, and so forth. These are new demands on already weakened statistical offices. You get the basic kind of crowding out effect that you have, um, very, you have a limited manpower. There is more and more ad hoc funds coming in chasing a limited uh, amount of, of staffs and offices. So you get a, a, a disorganization about how uh, statistical um, offices are organized. Uh, if you are going to use the growth evidence, as I put forward, the 1960s to 1970s, the best recorded, you'll be very, very hesitant to talk about any time series, particularly that, that crosses 1980s, and also the recent growth evidence is in question. Um, so, you know, Paul Collier suggested that maybe the decline was a, an artifact of the data and that really there was an underestimate uh, of the decline. So he came, makes the case that there is an even stronger case for the bottom billion that there actually is. Paul Collier unfortunately got this wrong, it's the opposite. The mm -hmm. uh, uh, decline was overestimated as the statistical office did rely too much on their formal administrative data. Then, on the other hand, post-structural adjustment growth in many economies, like Tanzania and Zambia particularly, is very overestimated because they re-accounted and changed their base years in the 1990s and then made bigger allowances for the informal economy. Uh, very recent growth data, as you understand, you'll be a bit hesitant about using uh, the Ghanaian growth statistics because we are, you'll be a bit concerned about how this extra economy is put in there. We know that this 60% came sometimes during the 1980s, how much was missing in 1993, and when did it come, and so forth, that rate is, is, is a problem. Uh, and some countries' GDP is severely underestimated, such as in Nigeria. So that's the, the kind of rough uh, data user uh, advice at this moment. Some lessons, any ranking, of course, of uh, African countries according to GDP is going to be misleading given the uneven use of methods and access to data. Some countries have a very accurate, relatively uh, accurate picture, some has uh, very much less so. Any statement of growth, particularly over a short period of time, is likely to be affected by this. So these kind of studies that uh, associate policy change with growth change and so forth, uh, is matters uh, will be affected by this. Do remember that when you read papers about Poverty, these are always based on elasticities with regards to national accounts, to GDP. So the same warnings will apply there. Um, so what to do about this? I think for data users, you need to question your evidence, of course. As any sound historical investigator, you would like to know, do some source criticism. Who produced this data? Under what conditions? Were they biased when they produced the data? And so forth. Data disseminators have some way to go. The World Bank needs to label their product correctly. 
I think they should have a different color for those data that do not exist, the ones that they made up, uh, for sure. Uh, I know that in the Zambian Statistical Office, they do use this method of, in the 1970s, I read in a report, they had the two asterisks, uh, one, one asterisk for guesstimates and two uh, asterisks for very weak guesstimates. Uh, and you could do the same type of, uh, of, uh, of labeling. Uh, donors need to take this coordination uh, situation seriously. The problem is that right now we have this drive towards evidence-driven policy, but we have not thought through clearly data for whom and who should decide uh, which is uh, data, uh, who produces this data, and it's ultimately down to governments and statistical offices to, to agree upon what is the data that are needed and, and how do you align to, with the priorities of donors to do so. Uh, so we need a new agenda for data for development. Uh, it means that you know you need to think about that the statistical offices is, should not become, as they are slowly becoming, a, a kind of a data collection agency for hire. That should actually, you know, it is a, a a kind of tool through which the states get to know things about itself. It is a bit disconcerting that they don't the limit limited voice they have in deciding uh, what information they want to collect. Why don't we have unemployment statistics? Why don't we have GDP statistics? We have a lot of poverty statistics, water supply statistics, mm -hmm. you know, so forth. These are all, you know, it really matters. Well, you know, it really counts what you count. And therefore, we need to think clearly about aligning a statistical agenda with, with development agendas. Um, so, to conclude, numbers matter. Any evaluation of Africa's rise must begin and end with a careful evaluation of the growth and income evidence. Without such analysis, as I show in the book, you might end up telling stories of statistical fiction. Uh, and and uh, we need to take that into consideration because poor numbers are too important to be dismissed as just that. Thank you. Thank you very much.